It was a very exciting moment in 2005 uh, to be in New York and speak at uh, CTBUH. Um, it was indeed a, a his, historic moment. Um, the world had changed. The understanding um, and also fear of the skyscraper uh, had changed. Um, and it was a time, uh, I think, that was really demanding uh, new ideas and, and new questions um, and new answers uh, to what the tall building could be. Um, we saw two amazing uh, talks, uh, one really about great architectural craft, um, one about um, all the technology we could possibly imagine. I want to talk about something else today. I want to speak about the tall building uh, and buildings altogether um, as a social question and as that of a social organism. Um, our skylines today from Hong Kong uh, to New York uh, to here are interestingly close to each other. Some buildings are great, others are not, but in some ways they're all very vertical typologies and in some ways we're here to celebrate this verticality but I think nonetheless we may want to think about what others already thought about 50 years ago. So if this is today then this is what architects thought about 50 years ago. The Japanese metabolists thought about buildings that would virtually float in the air. The Brits made building walks, walk. Cedric Price, uh, shown earlier today, with his fun palace, an amazing idea that a building should also be a public playground, should be there for people to explore their own creativity and their own uh, social needs. The Americans wanted to put a lid on it. <laughs> and um, somehow, Hollywood delivered another great vision of the perfect life with the Truman Show, some of you may remember. Um, and indeed today we all live in a fully produced reality show of our own lives. But um, what, what happens to our cities if things uh, continue? This is Hollywood again with the counter vision. Of course, both are always uh, delivered nearly simultaneously. But where are our cities going and um, what do we need to think about? And I want to show a series of projects that were really an exploration of thinking about the tall building and what it could be and what it maybe needs to address uh, for our future. The first building you all know, CCTV in Beijing, it was really an exercise about um, turning verticality into something else. We took the vertical needle and bent it into a loop of interconnected activities. So it was the idea of creating a building that was not about vertical stacking, but actually about being together in a circuit of exchange and collaboration, and therefore thinking a building as a different uh, uh, social structure. This image always still reminds me of uh, biology classes at school when you think of the human body with its organs and circulatory systems. Really to think of a building as a life form, something that is inhabited by human beings, by people, and how such a life form could function. If you dissect this life form, you can actually identify uh, a series of technical clusters. This is a television station, this is broadcasting news and program production intertwined with a series of social clusters, spaces for people to meet, to congregate, to exchange ideas and communicate. And an idea that those two systems intertwined together would ultimately make a building, a great building. And it was the idea of the loop that of course then became the circulatory systems, elevators and unfortunately time was not quite right yet to have them move both vertically and horizontally, but this of course would be exactly the building to explore such a technology. This is the building as it stands uh, in Beijing since exactly uh, 10 years for the Olympic Games 2008 and the different uh, structural uh, properties, of course, that were also explored uh, in this building. But in some ways it was also an exercise how to make a tall building not that tall because if we would have unfolded the loop and built it as a vertical tower, it would have been 750 meters tall with a two and a half thousand square meter floor plate. So just to understand that maybe sometimes design is not always just about reaching the height, but maybe sometimes making things proportional uh, in a very, very different way. The second building I want to speak about scale. Um, the issue of the tower is that it is 
predominantly scaleless. We actually don't know how tall a building is when we stand in front of it. I remember as a 10-year-old going to Manhattan and standing in front of the World Trade Center and looking up there and thinking, why is that not taller? I thought it was the tallest thing in the world. And it was at the time, but it was so hard to gauge because essentially the vertical extrusion has no scale. And I wanted to think about a skyscraper that could reveal the scale of human inhabitation inside and that could, in a way, project the idea of human activity back out to the city. So I took this mute shaft and started to open it up and erode it with a pixelated structure to merge the scale of the tall building and the scale of the uh, city and the ground of the city into one. Uh, the building is called Mahanakon. It is Thailand's tallest building with uh, uh, nearly a thousand feet. And this is the completed structure as it stands in the city. And you see in this photograph very nicely how the scale inside the tower and the scale of the surrounding city suddenly start to merge and communicate. And if you look closer, of course, these are spectacular apartments, floating living rooms and terraces above the city that really engage the human being in a three-dimensional sense of life and activity and project this message of, uh, of activity inside the building to the outside. These are all photographs of the real building. It was also an exploration of the base. How does a tall tower meet the ground and how does a podium of a building not repel urban life but actually bring it in and reflect it back out? How can a tall building engage the city not only in the air but also on the ground? So I continued this uh, pixelated uh, surface and created a really a social space of uh, interactivity and and uh, uh, public, uh, public domain at the ground, um, where the terrace no notion of these pixels coming down really celebrates public activity in an almost voyeuristic sense of cafes and restaurants and everybody watches each other because ultimately what we celebrate in the city is that we're all together as a huge social enterprise. These are a few pictures of the completed building. But the idea that the life of the city would rise up in the tower and really activate the building was the, the driving force. Now, even the top of the building, we kept clear of any MEP. And um, in about a month, uh, the observation deck of the tower will open completely, uh, open 360 degrees views with a nice little, this is a photo of a little steel beam that I pulled out of the building that has a single piece of glass on it where you can enjoy 1,000 feet of nothingness and the city below you. The next building, um, a twin tower project in Singapore, completed this year, is a project that somehow speaks about the city and the civic qualities of the city. Many skyscraper cities or tower cities have exactly this problem. One tower is built here, another there. You can find them beautiful or possibly the most ugly buildings you could find. But the space in between is completely left undefined. And there's an entire lack of, of spatial coherence in many of the cities. And I wanted to design this project not simply as an addition of another unrelated object, but solve this completely desolate uh, urban context through inserting a building that was not denying the existence of others, but actually integrating them into a larger whole. So I started to carve a series of spaces away from the allowable building mass to create two uh, buildings um, that with their curvature started to integrate uh, the neighboring uh, project. And you can see here in the, in the aerial photograph how suddenly they make sense out of a context that didn't make any sense before. So it was really an idea for how to create a more coherent sense of city and how to inscribe the quality of a public space that with, um, of course, also the understanding of environmental flows, airs, how we create microclimates in the tropics, uh, in those courtyards, very important, but how we would really create a spectacular space that was suddenly uh, coherent and cohesive and would integrate the city uh, as a whole. The facade, the shading system, um, but also, of course, an, an expression and articulation of this elegant curvature of these, uh, of these facades, but very importantly, a ground that becomes a great garden and pedestrian area and public space for the city. 
Um, the entire ground is pedestrianized, uh, open 24 hours a day. Um, we worked with a lot of passive cooling intelligence uh, to be able to realize this, but really to hand this piece of city back over to the city and the public, I think is one of the great achievements of the project as it doesn't simply privatize space, um, but beyond the private space that is built, uh, invigorates uh, the public realm. And you see here all the gardens. Um, I'm also doing all the landscape design because somehow I believe that the integration of nature and architecture is one of the very important challenges we're dealing with. Um, <clears throat> The building is itself is really conceived as a civic nexus that meshes together all the things it uh, formerly isolated. A historic district, Kampong Glam, next to it, an underground subway station, a bus stop, a very busy uh, shopping district. And where there was nothing in between all of these is suddenly a new center that brings people together uh, and unites the city as a whole. Another project that some of you may know um, is uh, the interlace. Um, this was a project that altogether questioned the need for uh, verticality if we are building tall buildings. The initial brief um, demanded 20, uh, 12 towers of 24 floors. But I thought the issue of living together and the issue of the human being as a as a, as a social creature is maybe not answered in residual space between towers only. So I toppled the towers and stacked them up as horizontal bars. And what looks like um, almost random from the side when you get into the development or, or onto a helicopter, you understand uh, the stacking system in a hexagonal grid actually creates huge spaces, gardens and courtyards, spaces for the inhabitants that in a way extends um, the, the private realm of their apartments into uh, a realm of gardens and nature. Um, it's, a very, it's a spectacular space, but actually a space that we built at such a low cost point that you could classify this nearly as affordable housing. It was uh, in, the, in the lower uh, half of the, of the cost spectrum of what housing in Singapore would achieve. And you see this intricate nature of, of interconnectivity, of multiple layers of spaces. And it was this idea of, of striation from communal spaces shared by all to semi-communal, semi-private, and fully private spaces that give an enormous range of choice and of freedom of what you do uh, and, and maybe also uh, where you are or where you sometimes uh, disappear in a place to live in. A little piece of maths that worked incredibly well to, to support our uh, theory of, of expanding life. Um, if we count the ground uh, of the site minus the footprint of the buildings, but we add back all the green we put on the roof terraces, we are realizing 112% green of the site. So we have more nature than if we had not built a building. And this is simply a proof that buildings do not always have to stand against nature or take things from nature but maybe can uh, rather amplify that condition. This is the 13th floor uh, of one of these roof terraces. So it's not green as a decorative uh, alibi, but it is really space to live for the people. This is a view into one of these courtyards and the building as it stands. And of course, um, I was uh, very excited when 2014, um, um, we got the first ever uh, Urban Habitat Award for it because I felt it was so important that it is not only about the tall buildings, but also the quality of life that the council ultimately administers and really values. This is a new project I'm, I'm working on in Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh City. Um, it's a, a thousand foot uh, tower with a larger uh, ensemble, but we're essentially building the centerpiece for an entire new city on the, on the half island, uh, which is likened by people there to the new Pudong um, of Vietnam, and it's, it's an incredibly exciting uh, place actually to work. It is one of the youngest cities uh, in the world. There's an incredible energy like what uh, some other parts of, of Asia from China to, to Thailand had maybe 25 years ago. And, and really the question of how could you give a place like that a specific identity and how could we think of the hyper tall and hyper dense future of these cities while reintegrating nature maybe as one of their uh, main um, 
uh, identities. And I think especially in a country like Vietnam, nature is so beautiful and powerful that we wanted to create a new synthesis between the nature on the ground and a nature that we could imagine being mirrored into the sky. So the building, um, we, we had dubbed it Sky Forest, um, was, was really a notion that part of this nature, this fantastical nature, could be lifted up into the sky and actually be part of an extension of public life of the city accessible to all people in an observation deck and actually a, a great adventure garden that would not only give views outside but via multiple levels really uh, provide a fantastic landscape of experience and recreation, restaurants that float in water uh, nearly 300 meters uh, above the ground. And this project, I think, in, in many ways, together with its, with its very organic ground, um, really tries to, to create a new prototype for, for tropical uh, living um, in Asia. And it is this interest for me to, to search for new beginnings and new prototypes that um, can be ideas uh, maybe to, to open up the thinking of what buildings and skyscrapers could be. Now, from the large projects in Asia, I want to make a jump and show two projects in the West that we're working on that are much smaller in scale, but maybe not necessarily less relevant in terms of thinking of what uh, an, a skyscraper actually could be like. This is a tower um, we're about to start construction early next year in Vancouver, a, a residential tower. And those of you who know Vancouver know that it's an incredibly beautiful city with a great quality of life, the water, the mountains, uh, the park, um, and a city that in many ways is a beautiful city, but also a city that is, like so many other places, a very vertical city. And if you look at these buildings, I always wonder, why does nobody want to work with that great environment and work with that great city? And could there not be a much more three-dimensional way of becoming an active inhabitant of a city, of engaging the space and becoming part of this spectacular uh, space. So I took the, the vertical tower uh, that we could build on the site, made it even more vertical in modular strands that were the perfect apartment sizes, and then started to fold out some of these elements in the center of the tower, where things are usually the most boring, where values are least. And we, this gives us the, the opportunity to subtract space at the bottom where it's most problematic and also sculpt the top uh, that is most spectacular. And in a way, thereby add a series of huge terraces that again uh, connect indoor and outdoor space for the people that live, but really create these huge arms that reach out into the city space, reach out into nature and connect the inhabitant with um, the spectacular surrounding that they ultimately live in. Of course, also the ground public space, always important here. We totally minimized the footprint of the tower to nearly only a core and a lobby, and then gave a lot of space back uh, to the public domain. The last building to show is um, a tiny little building in Germany, in Frankfurt. It's interesting because this thing is about 50 years old, and in this whole theme of 50 back and 50 forward, this is what was done 50 years ago, a brutalist office building, concrete, and clearly a building that is no longer appropriate or adequate to our times. And while um, uh, the UK is trying to figure out how to, how to deal with Brexit, of course, Paris and Frankfurt are celebrating that many of the bankers are moving over. So, there was an opportunity to, to turn this into um, a luxury residential uh, building. And I wanted to think about how can, we, how can we deal with existing substance? It's actually a really big topic also for, for the high rise. Many buildings reach a point where they are no longer adequate to their time, 40 years, 50 years later. And how can we reimagine a tower in a way that is more than just refacading it, but really intervening in it that gives it an entirely new life and new possibility. So we not only took the facade of the building, but then also um, took out all the technical floors that had the wrong floor to floor height for residences, filled in floors at the bottom um, to maximize the usable area, but then at the top, instead of again, just doing a boring infill, we simply decided to cut the columns and uh, use the opportunity to set a completely new, exciting volume uh, at the top. Um, 
but what was great about the building is that uh, it's, it's something you would never do for a residential building. It has four mega columns at the corners and free spanning floor slabs in between. That stuff they almost only did in the 70s. Today, nobody wants to pay for it anymore. But we found this and I said, like, isn't this an, an incredible opportunity because you suddenly have a 20 meter window wall without a single column in it. And I wanted to emphasize this horizontality even more. So I slid in what I called panorama plates to give the building an even more horizontal expression and then sculpted the top uh, to follow that logic. And this is the new tower, which is actually a 50 year old building, um, but it's probably a more radical building. And here you see this totally open panoramic view. It's probably a more radically different building than all the buildings that have been built over the past 20 or 30 years uh, in that city. And you can see the stark difference of what architecture can do when it starts to address um, a building as an organism, as a life form, and really think about how people could live inside those buildings. Thank you.